Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to the 23rd SF Doc Fest. Uh, we're so excited to have everyone joining us today uh, for our Bay Area Shorts local program. Welcome to our filmmakers. I'm Sarah Marie Flores, uh, the Shorts programmer here at SF Doc Fest, and I'm so excited to present these films. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome. Hello. I would love hi. I would love to kick things off just by um, hearing your name, what your role was on your project, and what was the genesis of this story? How did you find it, or how did you become attached to work on it? And I would love to start with Samantha and Max. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having us. Um, I'm Samantha Gerard. I'm the director and producer of Swords in the Sand. Uh, I'm Max Miles. I'm the DP of Swords in the Sand. Um, how the project sort of began is actually kind of a funny story. Um, we just moved to LA and um, I knew our neighbor through my parents who were there as well. And um, he was, he reached out to me and he was like, Hey, I really want to do some videography about like my artwork and what I do. I was like, yeah, let's talk about it. And so the more that we started to like talk about, it, I was like, this is a, this is a documentary. Like we need to tell this story as a story. And um, we sort of just like threw a crew together with me and him and and Todd, who's the painter. And um, we just went to a studio and we just started recording. And the more we did, the more we were like, this is really something cool. And we're really excited to share it with people. So that's how it came to be. And it's nice. It's nice being a part of the, the Roxy kind of theater because it's kind of full circle. I'm born and raised in San Francisco, co so going to the Roxy Theater when I was in like high school is, is it's kind of a dream come true to kind of come back as a filmmaker. Oh, that's so beautiful. Uh, the Roxy is such a special place and I'm so glad that it's our festival's home. Uh, I think a lot of us grew up there that were in the Bay Area. I, I kind of became an adult working there. So I'm so happy to hear that. Thank you, Max. Awesome. Well, uh, let's kick it over uh, to Key and Mohammed. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Let us know what your film is and how you kind of found the story and became attached. Sure, yeah, I'll start here. I'm Key. I'm the, I guess, director, editor of uh, Silk and Iron, which actually has a very similar origin story as Sam and Max's. Um, I also happened to move to a new community. I'm in the Bay Area here, but uh, I, I moved into a new neighborhood and my neighbor who at the time was my neighbor he's sitting he's right there on the call as well had a very burgeoning interest in the antique business and started kind of going into that world and we started talking a little bit more about how his business was going and he ended up kind of getting connected more into the community out towards point richmond out here and um through that he ended up meeting a uh, professional restorationist a restoration artist who's uh our subject of our documentary he's very motivated and interested in um restoring samurai arm so like he did not just that but he um dabbles mostly in that so we started kind of just organically coming together and realizing you know this might be kind of cool to at least get an interview with this guy like he has a lot he has to say he has a very unique viewpoint on preservation versus uh, you know redoing objects of you know from the past so we just kind of uh naturally gravitated toward his i guess sensibilities it's it was very unique and uh, of course me being uh, me having a camera, we just threw it up and then ended up starting to film a whole bunch of things. And it kind of came together just in in the edit, really, where we were just like, this is really cool. So let's see where it goes. And uh, that ended up being the film you see. So it's pretty cool to see it. I agree that it's really cool to see it screen at the Roxy. The Roxy is, uh, to me, it's just great to see it still standing, you know, after all these years of like other theaters that I, cause I've also worked in the theater business. Um, it just it's nice to see it still there and that the community is keeping it afloat. So it's really awesome to be a part of that. Uh, and I guess I'll, with that, kick it over to Mohammed. Yeah, thanks, Key. Um, just to kind of follow up a little bit on what he was saying is the, I came across our subject in the, in the video um, by just meeting essentially through networks and was really blown away by everything he had to say in his history, his story, the way he's connected um, to a lot of these pieces that he talks about in the film. Um, and it just was kind of an easy 
light bulb that came to me that like, hey, we have to we have to get this documented. We have to record this. We have to work with some people on it. So um, yeah, and he kind of surprised me a little bit. He said that you know he was this is what he did as I started to get to know him more. This was something that he does for work, also hobby. And then when he started putting it together, I was really blown away. And like he said, it just kind of came together really well, uh, really naturally. Yeah, and that's about it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mohammed. You're really the instigator here. Like you created all of the good, the good uh, moments to kind of get everyone together. That's always one of my favorite parts about producing. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm um and last but certainly not least gabby hello thank you so much for joining us let us know the title of your film and what your role was and how you found this story absolutely thanks so much for having me um my film is a certain personality um and it focuses on a group of big wave um surfers um that are all women um and locally based here in san francisco um, and actually one who's um, younger generation, when I met her, she was 15. She's from Half Moon Bay. Um, so it's a story of them um, surfing big waves and kind of their relationship um, to the ocean, to Ocean Beach in particular, um, as, you know, a gnarly, intense place uh, to go surfing. And the project came about, actually, um, Red Bull uh, originally hit me up. Uh, they were starting a new series called In Plain Sight, um, which is kind of like a siloed, um, group of doc stories they were um, putting out there and wanted to focus on NorCal stories um, on like surf photography was one genre um, city surf project um, and they wanted to work with a female director doing a piece about uh, women surfing big waves which was a huge topic I was like that's kind of a huge scope um, and there wasn't you know a crazy budget for it so um, I had to, I reached out to people in my community. I knew Sashi Cunningham, um, who's also working on her own piece um, called Sea Change about uh, equality in the surf world and equality for um, big wave women surfers. Um, and it's a feature film, a doc piece. So I didn't want to step on her toes too much, but at the same time kind of wanted to honor her and the work she's doing and also focus on um, some core people in her community. Um, so yeah, it kind of evolved from there. That's awesome. Um, Gabby, I'm going to stick with you, actually. I would love to dig in a little bit deeper about what it meant for you to tell a story about existing in a space that I think is often thought as kind of exclusively male, right? Like, we know that there are, like, women and non-binary surfers and people that do all kinds of sports, but I don't think we give it as much um, of a spotlight when we talk about these sort of things. So, like, how 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 was that for you to kind of approach from that angle and, you know, working with all these amazing athletes, like as they're kind of navigating this space. Yeah. I think what's interesting is like the space definitely feels equal. There's definitely like so many, um, you know, big wave surfers doing it and doing it, you know, just as good, if not better than the guys out there. I think the problem and the difference is there's not the visibility, right. You know, so you don't like, even when I was like, oh, surely, you know, there's a, there's gotta be a film on Bianca Valenti or Paige Alms or, um, Carissa Moore. And, you know, just recently, I think Red Bull put out a cool little doc piece on Carissa Moore and she's one of the top female surfers in the world right now, but there's just not the visibility. Um, and there's just not that content out there. And um, working, I ended up making another film with Zoe, the um, the fifteen year old. Um, she's now seventeen, I think. Uh, but she was just like, yeah, there's not like I don't see that much content out there, and I wish there was more cool badass videos, like on a high level, you know, not like shot on an iPhone, but just kind of really cinematic and um, just having that younger generation perspective of like, yeah, I feel, I feel equal out there. I feel, you know, I don't feel like it's the boys club, but I don't see it, you know, in, in like our content that we're representing. So it felt really cool to kind of like get behind that and be able to tell the story and, um, do it in kind of like really, I wanted to make it really beautiful, really, really cinematic. It was definitely a challenge, um, working with the ocean as a character <laughs> and not, you know, giving us the best waves or the best conditions when we wanted it. But um, yeah, it felt like a really important um, piece to get out there. And I hope there's, you know, many more that will come out. Um, and in general, you know, more pieces about female athletes. Most certainly. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about this a lot, just with what was kind of happening with the WNBA draft 
right? And like that narrative where we just, we we don't give the spotlight, especially in the way that we invest in media mm -hmm. um, to these spaces, which is like insane because, I mean, not to like trivialize anything, but like I am the kid that grew up on a league of their own, right? Which is like a very different thing, but <laughs> like <movie>. highlighting how <laughs> badass women and non-binary folks can be in these spaces without like making it feel like you're pandering or undercutting like the true athleticism and dedication that they put into their crafts. Totally. Yeah, totally. And I think that was like kind of an interesting uh, point that came out from this of talking to Sachi and um, Beth Price and Anna that are a little, you know, they're older than Zoe and they've been out there and kind of like, you know, cutting their teeth on at Ocean Beach for a while and being some of the first women surfing out there and then also talking to Zoe who doesn't have hasn't had that experience as much and she's seen women out there with her and so kind of like it's cool that like they had that generation and, and even women you know before them had to kind of like set this standard and set this tone in order for this younger generation to be able to step up and feel comfortable and feel more like at ease you know in these spaces that have been in the past male dominated. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Gabby. Totally. Thank um, you. I'm going to jump over to Key and Muhammad. I would just love to hear about like what your process was in um, working with Gary. And I think one of my favorite things about filmmaking, especially documentary filmmaking, is you're looking at something from one direction. And then as soon as you kind of get to work with your subject and you know, engender a sense of trust, like this whole other vein of conversation can come about and being able to capture that and shape that through filmmaking, I think is really important. So um, Key, I think maybe we'll, we'll kick it off with you. Like, how did you approach that, I guess, in the way that the, actually in the way that the film is shaped and Mohammed, like, I would love to hear like what your role was and how you two collaborated and bringing it to that space. Yeah, sure. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head there when you said that, that it's all about the process of discovery, right? Where it's like, I, you know, we instantly the hook was just that this guy is very passionate about a very unique object, right? Like these, uh, the, like the armor in in um, throughout history. Is just, I think everyone's been fascinated in samurai armor, especially like doesn't really get much better than that for really interesting antiques, especially something that you want to film, right? So when we were kind of uh, working with Gary to try and find a story. I guess it was more like he's he has no shortage of ideas. He has no shortage of perspective on uh, preservation and restoration, right? Which to him is very much about, as you saw in the film, um, maintaining little nicks and dings and pieces of like history, the imperfections that you see on something that kind of like show the life it's lived versus trying to erase them. And he actually did make a really interesting comment on that note that we didn't end up putting in the film, but it was very relevant about like how you see that all, all the time today on like, you know, social media and digital spaces where people will constantly try to go back and rewrite that history. Um, but in this case, of course, it's like physically on the objects where you see like a scratch or like a terror. And uh, to him, that's all part of like, as a, it's it was interesting to me to hear as, you know, from a restoration artist, that you shouldn't necessarily clean those up. Like, you know, one of the points he makes is that a lot of people, especially really rich collectors will come in and they'll try to like make it absolutely perfect, right? They want to do it, tear it all down then build it right back up so it looks shiny and new. But his view, which is the thing that I really resonated with was that you shouldn't do that. You should, you know, restore it as best you can so that it, it's functional or like at least it, it looks, you know, like it's a, it, it's whole but you should try and actually emphasize and like let those little imperfections rest as they are. So when we were just, it started with us just, you know, interviewing him. Um, it was a really long interview too, where we just kind of, Muhammad and I just kind of asked him a bunch of questions because these, these stemmed of course, from like conversations we had had with him in, you know, just in passing. Right. And uh, he and Muhammad had, had uh, known each other quite well. So it was easy to kind of just pick his brain on like, Hey, what do you want to, kind of delve into but yeah one thing led to another and then he started talking more but he's very philosophical as you could see in the uh the film like he really drives the whole thing and to me when putting it together in the edit it was about how do you make what he's saying um you know where where's kind of the 
where is that through line, right? Like, what's the the real point of it? And it, again, it ended up boiling down to less about the armor itself, but more about th his views on preservation, right? Um, of course, it's really easy to uh, film something like samurai armor and antiques because it's just so visually beautiful. Um, you know, it could be anything from him, like just putting it together to it just sitting on on the wall, right? Um, so it was really easy. And I, I was trying very hard not to fall into the trap of let's just shoot the crap out of this armor and like make it look good. It actually had to have like that sort of the, you know, the uh, the significance of what he was saying attached to it, right? So like, if you see in the film, you see like the shot of his eyes through the mouth and like um, him kind of putting together something from a, a bird's eye view. It's like these little um, shots that we did were hopefully trying to make it you know, really kind of, uh, uh, what's the word, support what he was saying, right? And because, uh, again, it was very difficult. Like, it was so easy to just be like, let's just shoot this again. Let's just shoot this, like, sword coming out or let's, you know, do something like that. But um, really finding it in post was where that the film was made because we just had a lot of footage and a lot of what he would say. And then after kind of seeing what else we needed, we would maybe go back and be like, hey, can we film this other thing? Maybe with you talking to, like, a customer or, like, you in the shop, you know? So it was really, again, like the only way I could put it is organic. Like the whole thing came together very organically. We didn't really have like a specific plan. We just, it just, you know, kind of shows what's awesome about documentary, right? So like if you just have a cool subject or somebody who has a really unique point of view, it really can help, uh, you know, make, it, it makes something worth watching and worth uh, putting together. So uh, we really lucked out with an awesome subject, subject but, um, his point of view made it also unique in that it wasn't just like any, I mean, there's a, there's tons and tons of content out there about armor and Japanese history, yeah. but his point of view was what made it different. So that's what I really liked about that process. Awesome. Thank you so much, Key. Uh, and yeah, Mohammed, I would just love to hear kind of how you approached this collaboration, right? Like, I think that when you work in the narrative space, the relationship between a director and a producer is a little bit more predetermined. And I think in the documentary space, uh, a great producer can really like help get in there and shape the conversation and really have uh, a sense of authorship with that collaboration. So I, I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so as Key mentioned, right, Gary and I have, uh, we've been friends for a while and uh, we were we're both obviously in the space. He's been in the space for a lot longer than I have. Um, and one of the biggest conversations that me and Gary were having was around, I mean, there's opinions for everything, right? Um, you can, it doesn't matter who you are, everybody has a different opinion about things. And Key kind of touched on that a little bit where some people prefer things to be, for example, fully restored, looking brand new, looking essentially back to, how it traditionally was the day it was created or maintained in a proper way. Um, other people don't, other people like to see that history. They like to see the rest and they like to see just the time and the age and the patina, I guess you could call it on the items. So that was a big thing that Gary and I really talked a lot about um, surprisingly, which was you know, what angle we're going to take and how far we're going to swing on that angle. Um, just because from a from the antique community, from that perspective, there is a lot there that there's just so many opinions about it. Um, so there was a lot of discussion around there. Obviously, location wanting something, you know, oh, is this going to be correct? I think, um, you know, you guys were discussing about how obviously the location from a from a filming perspective could be really difficult because the elements, nature, all of that. Um, we obviously didn't want something that was going to take over um, and take away from just the armor because there was there's so. I think we lost your audio. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry about that. Look at that, Apple products. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, those were kind of, so those are probably the biggest things that, that Gary and I were discussing really. And then really just some of the other locations. We did two different filming locations. So getting that stuff prepared, getting, you know, 
the right timing and everything set up. Um, but Key and I worked really great together. I think that there wasn't really any problems. Like you said, it was all very organic. And then Gary <laughs> coming in at yeah. the last, you know, from his perspective, from a, he's more of a designer. Um, and so him just kind of giving some of his last final opinions about just the physical spaces and things like that and what we're talking about and stuff. Um, it really just worked out really well, which, you know, I hope it continues that way. That's, <laughs> it's always a blessing. I think it, the filmmaking process is always so unpredictable, uh, no matter how much you plan. Um, so I loved hearing that journey. Thank you both so much. Um, and now let's talk about Swords in the Sand. Um, I think I would like to talk about kind of two, two frames. And Samantha, I would love to start with you and just kind of talk about how you worked with Todd to kind of bring out his story. Uh, and then Max, I would love to touch upon like your approach to capturing that because I think that you did something that can be difficult to do, right? Like you made like maybe like a more static setup feel very cinematic and have a sense of scope. I think that's really like working within the confines of like how Todd is expressing himself and how uh, Sam is like really setting these things up for success. So. Sorry, that's a very awkwardly worded question, but take it away. No, I, I actually, <clears throat> I love that because it was really funny to to talk to Todd about it because he's he's done like press tours and stuff like that before, but I don't think he's really ever done a film. And he was like, oh, I, I want it to be about the art. Like, I don't want it to be about me. It's all about the art. And while I think that's so true, it is so much about what he's creating um, I definitely had to talk to him and be like, no, there's, there's so much about you making this art that is so fascinating. Like, how did you get started? And so I think really just having those like genuine conversations with him, especially like during the interview parts. Um, I'm an actor as well. So I love to just talk to people. And so we really just like chatted for a couple hours. And when we were filming in his studio, um, it really just felt like three artists kind of coming together and being like, okay, we're just going to see how this goes. Like, I'm just going to let you do your process and we're going to, we're going to film it and hope for the best. And, um, it was so cool to like, sort of be like, okay, well, we've got this, like, now let's move on to like some closer stuff. And we really didn't plan any particular shots. I just told him that I want to show a lot of like different parts of his process. So, we were like, okay, like we haven't really seen this yet, or we haven't seen you grind um, the paint into the canvas. Like, let's see that. And we, we didn't really talk much about it. We just filmed for like four or five straight hours. And we were very quiet the whole time. Cause we were just trying to capture like everything he does. And um, he's so proficient at it and he's done it so much. He's done his 10,000 hours that like you could literally just like let him go and he would fly. And so just kind of knowing that about him and his personality, I think that's sort of just how we approached it the day. And, and yeah, we just had a lot of fun. I think it was great. So, <laughs> but let, let's talk about your perspective because there was no static shots, period. Like you were constantly moving. Yeah. I, I think it helps as, cause I'm a camera operator. I, I started in, um, narrative filmmaking and it's kind of it was interesting making that jump because I've done a lot of narrative stuff and then I've also I've shot in San Francisco um, for artists like Lady Gaga and Motley Crue and and 21 Pilots and all that stuff so it's it was very interesting coming back to it it's sort of like a narrative when it tells a story and and it just tells the story of how Todd's processes and it, it was really nice capturing that because it felt like moving around kind of was following it was kind of like a like a dance with how he moves as an artist um so I think that 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 was it was so rewarding to kind of be holding that camera for five hours and just following him for two days um and just feeling not static because I hate static shots um, just being constantly moving it's kind of like what an artist does uh, when they're painting so it was it matched up perfectly I, th I think that's so true too about what you're saying how like it's like a dance because it really was they were like literally trading off steps and choreography with each other and like I was just kind of like 
in the back, like, this is great, <laughs> you know, but like those two are really, I think just playing off of each other. And like Max is so great with like movement and like being able to focus while he's doing multiple stuff. And Todd is just, it, it is a dance for him truly. So I think the fact that you guys were able to find your rhythm and they really, you guys really found your rhythm, which was so cool to watch. Um, it really shows that I think in the film in the end process. So, yeah, it does indeed. Uh, it comes across as just a, like a very fluid and kinetic piece. So thank you so much. Um, and actually that's all the time we have for our Q and A today. Uh, thank you so much to our filmmakers for sharing our stories and, and thank you to our audience for showing up and supporting Barrier filmmakers and stories. Uh, we can't wait to see what's coming out next. Thank you for hosting, Sarah. Nice to meet everybody. Yes. Thank you so yeah, much. Likewise. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. Bye.